Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So uh, we'd like to announce, first of all, who we have on the call. We have 10 panelists with us. Uh, so I'm Dr. Jennifer Spring. I'm the superintendent of the Cohoes City School District. I welcome all of our, our parents here this evening. So far, we have 30 parents on, on the call. So thank you for oh, growing already 32. So, so and uh, growing as we speak. So thank you for joining us this evening. I'd also like to announce who our panelists are here this evening. Uh, we've got our host, Aaron Cagwin, who is our communication specialist in our school district. We've got Cliff Bird, who is our principal of Abram Lansing. We've got Peggy O'Shea, our assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction. Erin Renessi, she is our assistant director of special programs. We have Dan Martinelli, and he is our principal of Cohoes Middle School. And in fact, he is our featured picture here. That was from today at um, Open Doors at Cohoes Middle School. Uh, here you can see him giving tours to new students, sixth graders, and parents. So, so thank you, Principal Martinelli, for doing that. We have Mr. Perry, Mark Perry, Principal of Harmony Hill. Thank you for joining us. And we have the very well-known and famous in Cohoes, Dr. DeTerzi, our school's medical director. We have Jim Stapleton, our director of facilities. So thank you everyone for joining us and um, uh, grateful to have all of our panelists who have worked very, very hard on all aspects of our reopening plan so that we can um, make that happen on September 9th. So, so thank you. So before we get started, I have a, a few um, important, I guess, announcements for parents. So Parent Square, if you have already not signed up for Parent Square, please. Um, it's on our website. There's an icon there. You can go in, you can sign in. Uh, it's it's a, a new tool for us, but a very important tool so that we can communicate with you and send you all the latest updates, surveys, all of those things. So please, if you're having trouble, uh, let your principal know and we can definitely uh, make sure that you get some assistance there. So additionally, when we talk about updates, please check our website, cohoes.org. Uh, please visit it frequently. We push out all news, we push out announcements, but it's really important that you do check uh, because all of the updates are there. So at the top of our, our website, you'll see a tool bar and uh, you will be able to view in, uh, in, in entirety our school reopening plan, frequently asked questions. I would definitely recommend looking at those FAQs because uh, we just put it up yesterday. A lot of those, your questions may be answered just from uh, checking those uh, FAQs and more information about COVID testing, contact tracing, and our fully virtual learning model, which we will also discuss this evening. So this is new. This is something we're excited about and happy to announce it for you. So in addition to our meetings this week, we also have um, reopening updates right before school starts on August 25th at 6 p.m. We'll be doing the same kind of format and then September 1st at 6 p.m., we're going to start some workshops for parents that will be virtual. And this one is off to a great start, social emotional supports. Uh, so please join us for that one. And then September 14th, navigating the district's technology platforms to some support remote learning. If you have questions this evening, please email them to feedback at cohoes.org and we'll do our best to answer those while we're on our call tonight. I've also gotten a call this afternoon, um, I mean, uh, uh, an email already, so I, I will share that one shortly. So, so here we are with our, our school calendar, uh, superintendent conference day, September 3rd and 8th. And just so you know, our teachers are, have been uh, very busy all summer, but uh, especially on September 3rd and 8th, 
Uh, they will be engaging in COVID safety training, EdLaw 2D, and then other technology platforms to help us uh, teach uh, this year, and social emotional learning and meeting student learning needs, differentiating instruction and being able to close uh, gaps. Um, so we just got, let's see, I did, did I just see uh, a chat from in the chat? Okay, Dr. Deterzi isn't able to hear anything, but she's going to keep working on it from her end. No, I'm all fixed now. Okay, very good, very good. All right, so our virtual, uh, fully virtual model, we're working on a date for Chromebook and materials distribution, and we will providing be providing more information about that. Um, one Chromebook per family, I'll talk more about that in our presentation. Our first day of school for virtual and on site is September 9th. So let's start with health and screening, health and safety and health screening. So what's new this year? Um, this is new obviously because of COVID. So each day you will get um, a reminder from Parent Square. Okay, it is the health attestation. You will have a questionnaire. The questions will ask you, first of all, is your child experience any of the COVID related symptoms? Cough, shortness of breath, chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, new loss of taste or smell. Does your child have a fever that's greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit or more? Has not come in contact with someone in the past 14 days who is experiencing COVID symptoms um, or, or tested positive and has not traveled to one of the areas which requires a 14 day quarantine upon return. So, so I, I know it sounds like a lot and I know a lot of mornings are really, really hectic just trying to get everybody ready and out of the house. But uh, we, this is a requirement that we have temperatures taken every single day and it is a requirement that we administer the questionnaire. So I do believe it's important to administer it every day so that we can stay on top of uh, maybe uh, of uh, any kind of spread here. So the big question is um, what will happen with this, these responses? So if you answer yes to any of those responses, okay, it will be sent to the principal, the school nurse or the main office or secretary or attendance aide. What happens if you don't submit? Well, we will take your temperature at school. Uh, we will have different entrances. The principals will be talking about that in, in a few minutes, um, but we will be taking temperatures. We do ask that parents do a test uh, to those questions and also take a temperature. So I would uh, recommend stocking up on thermometers in your houses so that you'll be able to uh, definitely help us because as you can imagine, logistically, this will not be easy trying to take all of these temperatures of our students upon arrival. So we have uh, already purchased some uh, handheld infrared thermometers as well as thermal scanners, which can more efficiently take students' temperatures. So I, I'd like to ask Dr. Deterzi just to comment on the importance of this daily health screening and maybe what uh, advice you can give to parents. So I really, it's very important that we do the temperature taking at home because if you have a kid with a temperature over a hundred, if, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. If your child has a temperature of 100 or more, um, they're not gonna make it through the day at school. They're gonna get picked up, they're gonna get sent home, they're not gonna fly under the radar. But when we can have somebody get this caught before they even go into the school, then they're not gonna expose anybody else. And even if you're absolutely certain that your child just has a regular non-COVID cold, well, you can't be that certain, but if you give that regular non-COVID cold to five other kids, that's five other families who are going to have to deal with getting testing and 
getting their child sent home and so on and so forth. So it's just super important that we just get in the habit of taking our temperatures first thing in the morning at home. Thank you. So we will have COVID safety training for all of our students this year. We do have a video from BOCES. Um, in addition to the video, we will all have, we will have lots of reminders, signage everywhere in our buildings and training our students on how to wear a mask, how to safely take a mask on and off, and what about washing your masks? Um, so, so those are some things that we'll be reviewing as well as respiratory hygiene and just building procedures because things will look differently this year and we want to make sure that uh, the expectation is clear. Face coverings. So all staff and students in grades pre-K through 12 will be required to wear a mask even when a six foot distance is maintained. Masks must cover the nose and the mouth. Acceptable ones include cloth masks, surgical masks, Gaiters and bandanas are not as effective. Face shields can be worn, but in addition to a mask. So if you're gonna send your child with a face, face shield, just make sure um, that they're also wearing a mask. So mask breaks will occur periodically throughout the day, ideally outside. The principals are working with staff to develop these protocols. If a student is a non-compliant mask wearer, well, what is the issue? So we will work towards compliance. Um, maybe the mask is just uncomfortable. Um, there are many reasons why uh, a student may not, you know, want to wear their mask. But, but again, we are trying to uh, ensure everybody's safe, safety, everybody's health, um, and we will definitely work with all of our students on why it's important. Um, and we may also get the principal not as a disciplinary measure, um, and also the school nurse to be involved in that. So we do have procedures in place for mask exemption due to medical reasons. Um, it, you may contact Peggy O'Shea, our assistant superintendent, who will be in communication with Dr. DeCherzy. Regarding this, we will require medical documentation um, and also a release for Dr. DeCherzy to speak to your medical provider. Disposable masks will be provided for all students, but you are encouraged to provide your own. Masks are also to be worn on the school bus during transportation. So, so I do want to talk about one question that I did receive this afternoon, and I'm going to have Dr. DeTerzi address this. So, so one parent writes that uh, she is concerned about her child having to wear a mask all day long and every day. Um, she, she's not sure if even two to three mask breaks are, are enough, um, especially those with, with asthma. Um, and also wondering why, even if we have students safely seated at a six foot distance in the classroom, why are we still requiring them to wear masks? Um, and let's see, at, in other, uh, let's see, in other situations, in other, uh, public places, um, as long as people have a six foot distance, they don't have to continue wearing the, their masks. So why why is it that schools are different? Dr. DeTerzi? Well, I think that's actually excellent email because whoever wrote it, Dr. Spring really summed up, I think, a lot of the feelings and thoughts that are on the minds of the many, many parents I've talked to this summer. Um, so I'm gonna start with the basic, what makes a school different from a restaurant? Uh, where we all know that once you're allowed to go in and sit at your table and take your mask off, as long as you're six feet away from everybody else and you're in your own zone. So um, we have it not just for our district, but for almost every district in New York due to the age of our buildings. Um, our HVAC systems are absolutely not up to, um, the standards that we would need for any kind of air circulation. So our kids are gonna be breathing the same air as each other for 45 minute periods at a time. And it doesn't matter if you're six feet apart or not six feet apart, by the end of that period, you're breathing the same air that everybody else is breathing. Um, masks keep droplets inside and it reduces the overall viral burden that enters that air in the first place. 
And it's frustrating because you can't see it happen, but it makes a huge difference. And at this point, six months into the pandemic, we have the evidence. We know that it does make a huge difference. Is it a 100% guarantee? No, but is it the difference between a small number of COVID cases that we can manage and operate around and a large number of COVID cases that'll shut us all down and send us home again? So this is why masks are super important. Um, I can't tell you if your kid is gonna be able to tolerate a mask all day. I can tell you that it's amazing. Um, kids are doing great with masks. Uh, nobody told them they were supposed to have trouble. Um, the kids who aren't used to it sometimes need to get used to it, but our children who've been in school this summer have been tolerating their masks very well. Our ch children who've been going to summer programs and summer camps have been tolerating their masks very well. Um, my own daughter told me that she didn't take any of the allowed mask breaks on one day of camp and she only took one on the second. Now that's only one kid. Um, there's definitely a perception that asthma makes it so that you really don't want to have, that somehow masks are less tolerated and that's just not the case. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the AMA have both come out with very decisive guidelines saying that basically almost nobody is going to qualify for a mask exemption. Nobody likes breathing stale air, um, and certainly kids who have asthma or who have allergies or who have sensitive cough reflexes are going to have to get used to it. Um, I know some kids don't do well if their mask has a lot of bits. So if, you're, if your fabric has a lot of sort of little fabric dust and fabric threads, they're not going to enjoy breathing through that mask all day. But I'd say practice. You know, don't order your mask for school to arrive the day before school starts and send your kid off. Just give it a practice. And remember that your child is probably going to be very willing to do something that every other kid sitting around them is doing much more so than they're going to be willing to do something for you at home when they would rather be playing on their Xbox. So we're going to start, we're going to give it a try. Mask exemptions are going to be very, very rare, um, but when they happen, you talk to your doctor, I'll talk to your doctor, we'll talk to the school, and we'll figure out what we need to do. Thank you, Dr. DeTerzi. And we will be talking with uh, uh, Jim Stapleton, he's our Director of Facilities, more about our ventilation. So, so we'll uh, we'll share that um, information in, in just a little bit. So, what if a student appears to be sick while in school, one of your children? So, what will happen? What will that look like? So, I'd like to ask Dr. DeTerzi again to uh, talk to parents about that. So one of the things that's going to be really hard this year and has proven hard for my families of kids who've gotten sick this summer is that you really can't tell if a kid has COVID by looking at them. You can't. Your parent instincts can't do it. You can't just know. Uh, the tests that I've had that have come back positive have been a surprise to everybody, including me. Um, the tests that have come back negative, there were kids that I thought were absolutely textbook and I was sure they were going to be positive. But the textbook is really for these uh, end stage COVIDs, the COVID cases that wind up in the hospital. They tend to all sort of converge on the same presentation. But if your child is sick, there is no way to know if they have COVID or not without a test. So what this means is that in New York State, and this is the whole state, not just Cohoes, if your child has symptoms consistent with COVID, they must go home or ideally stay home, please, because we're going to send them home anyway, and this way we don't expose our nurses um, and the other students. But they're going to go home, and they're going to need to stay home until it's been 10 days since they first got symptoms, and their symptoms have been gone for 72 hours. And that's not just the fever. Uh, that's all symptoms. That means they get a runny nose, they're going to be out until that runny nose is gone for three days. Um, and that's no matter what. Symptoms have to be gone for three days. If there is a PCR-based COVID test and the test is negative, then they just need to be symptom-free for 72 hours, and then they can come back. So ideally, your child is sick, you contact their doctor, you contact a test site, you can get a COVID test, it comes back quickly, 
and then you just have to ride out the cold at home in a way that you never would have to do in any other year. And as soon as your child is feeling well enough, they participate through online options, um, and then they return to school when they're safe. If you can't get a COVID test, if there's yet another nationwide backlog, we've written through several major nationwide backlogs since this started, then you're going to be learning from home for the full 10 days. Um, in the case of a positive, uh, that's health department territory, but I certainly would not be anticipating returning to school anytime soon. Um, you're certainly going to be looking at a full 10 days out. Um, and basically, if you don't go get tested, you're going to be out for the full 10 days. We're going to assume that we can't prove you didn't have COVID, so you're out for 10 days. So, that, all the yeah, so, so where do people get tested? Where yeah. would kids get tested? Ideally, in a perfect world, every single child has a primary care pediatrician that they know and that knows them and that that pediatrician is accessible. Uh, and of course, we hope that that's the case. So we would want you to contact your doctor and your doctor may send you to a test site and do a telehealth visit. Your doctor's nurse may order a test for you. Your doctor may have in-office tests. I know I've spoken to a lot of my colleagues. Most of us do not have the in-office tests yet. Many of us, including me, have been promised that we will have them for the 1st of September, but we've also heard these promises before during this pandemic. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, or so you go into your doctor's office and they perform the test there and send it out to the lab. Again, I wouldn't assume that your doctor can do that. I would always call and make sure Harmony Mills can do it, but that's not everybody. Um, and, uh, or you can call the 800 number and get a test site. Now, right now, a child is not a healthcare worker or a very at-risk person, so you're gonna be lower on the priority list for a test site test. There may be a day or two delay before you can be given one, which is, of course, gonna then delay your return to in-person learning, um, but that is certainly an option. And finally, if a child is in a situation where they do not have a doctor, do not have a transportation to a set test site, or just don't know what to do, um, that would be something to communicate to the school nurses because I am the Kahoot City school doctor. So I really want every kid taken care of by their pediatrician and their medical home. But at the end of the day, my office is there for anybody who needs us. So what is PCR-based testing? Is that different from just a regular COVID test? Um, it's almost, it's the opposite. Um, up until very recently, there weren't other COVID tests. However, at least one of the local doctor's offices is starting to do something called the antigen tests. Those are not acceptable by any of the New York State protocols as a negative COVID test. Uh, they're, they've got so many false negatives that they're just not reliable. So the PCR test is anything that gets sent out to the lab anything that uses a rapid test that does a PCR machine, anytime you go to one of those drive up sites um, and uh, put a Q-tip up your nose, that's what they're doing. Uh, but as long as you, if someone's going to do a test, as long as nobody says it's an antigen test, you're fine. If anyone's giving you a blood test, that is not okay for COVID return to school. Thank you. So I have a question here that, that I'll answer. Um, it's about, well, what happens if you're waiting for the COVID test and they, they take a long time? Um, you know, how will my child receive instruction while they're sitting at home waiting for those results? So we are still working out the details on this um, piece for when kids are sick. Obviously, we want them to continue their learning. Um, and we're working with our teachers association and defining what that expectation will look like for our teaching staff. So, so we will uh, have that those answers for our parents um, in the coming weeks before school starts, definitely. So what if there is a positive or suspected case of COVID in the school? So very first thing, um, if I'm alerted to that, I will contact the Albany County Department of Health. I'll contact Dr. DeTerzi. We will implement contact tracing. So, so that means we need to identify 
all of the people that either uh, this individual came in contact with and identify the effect of class, the affected classrooms, all the areas of the building, all individuals exposed, and then we will determine the extent of the closure. We'll notify our school community of the closure um, and of the exposure. So it depends, it, this will look different at the elementary versus the secondary schools. The elementary is a, a little easier since we have our students uh, grouped into pods where their contact is, is, is limited with others in the building. Um, but at the secondary level, definitely while we're trying to really mitigate exposure and spread, um, it, I think the impact would be farther reaching and uh, we may have um, more uh, people and students who would have to quarantine at that time. Dr. DeTerzi, would you like to add anything? I think that this, you know, everything that we've done, everything that the committee work has done over the entire summer, and that is to accept that if New York trends like the rest of the country, when schools reopen, COVID is going to increase. And even though I would really hope that we can identify everyone who's sick before they go to school, we may well be looking at cases of COVID that occur in school. And our goal is to keep entire buildings or entire districts from having to close because we've minimized the exposure, um, the potential exposure. And even in the case of people who have been exposed, their risk of actually catching it's going to be lower because they did maintain their social distancing and they did mask. Thank you. So we are utilizing multiple entrances for arrival and dismissal. And um, I do have some of our principals here. Would, would anyone like to share maybe what are some of the, the routines that are going to be in place in your buildings? I see Mr. Martinelli, principal of Cohoes Middle School. Go ahead. Good evening, Dr. So at the Coes Middle School, we are going to uh, bring the kids in through three separate entrances in the morning, which will be clearly marked and delineated. For example, uh, my new sixth grade friends are gonna come in at the center stair door, which is right where the uh, flagpole is. And my eighth graders are gonna come in the main door. And uh, I've got a, a back stairwell door to bring the seventh graders in. And those decisions are made by where kids are going in the morning to minimize transition traffic in the hallways. So we really think it's gonna work well at the middle school. Great, thank you. Any, anything else, Mr. Martinelli, about the middle school you wanted to share? About lockers? We're, we're super class. excited and ramping up to get kids back. And, and of course, you know, we're gonna have hand sanitizer in all the uh, classrooms and uh, we're gonna sanitize the desk for kids uh, uh, before the next round of kids come in. And we're really kind of thinking about uh, transitions and making daily decisions that it's going to make it safe for kids. So we've, we've been working uh, very hard on that at the middle school. I would encourage any parents uh, that have questions that they can contact me at any time. Call me at the school, email, parent square, uh, however you'd like me to reach out to you. I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I see Mr. Perry from Harmony yes. Hill. Hi, Dr. Spring. Can you hear me today? I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a victory. So Harmony Hill is going to have three doors to enter on. We're going to have two grades per door, and we're also going to um, we're going to color code the doorways. So there'll be two. Uh, there'll be a, a gold and a blue entry in both door doors, and there will be tiger tracks leading up to those colors, spray painted in a, in in that in that color. This will all be uh, written up and uh, and pictures drawn and so forth sent home to parents so they know exactly where to show up um, and drop their students off. We are also going to create a traffic pattern to get to get cars through our through our lots quicker. Um, and then we'll also be doing traffic patterns inside the building to make sure that we're our kids are as safe as possible and they'll be met at the doorways by their teachers and escorted to their to their classrooms. Uh, we're going to try to make it as simple as possible, but yet as smooth as possible. Thank you. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Bird from Abram Lansing, would you like to say a few words? 
Sure. Hey, um, I feel like I'm in romper room. I see. By <laughs> um, our drop off will be similar uh, to last year because we really only have one space to drop everybody off. But our, our entrance will be the same doors that we used for exits last year. So fourth and fifth grade will come in the main front door. Um, grades two and three will come in the door that everybody came in last year by the playground. And then kindergarten and first grades will come in the very south end door. So my suggestion would be if you're dropping off kindergarten and first grade students park in the parking lot at the end of the building, everybody else can drop off at the front as we go into these two doors. Thank you. We have Laura Tarlow, principal of Cohoes High School. Would you like to say a few words? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Spring. So I, I just want to start. I did send out to all um, high school families today. Hopefully you, you got that. Some important information, attachments about the reopening of the high school, um, important things to know. So if you're not on Parent Square, uh, we'll be sending a lot of information out through that. Uh, we will have three entrances, two will be designated to student arrivals and one to faculty and staff. Uh, our grades 9 and 10 students will be entering in the glass vestibule area down by the gymnasiums um, and we will have a check-in procedure and process in place there and then students will, uh, using that uh, entrance, will go up the main stairwell, can get grab and go breakfast on their way up. And our 11th and 12th grade students will be entering through our main entrance and using the front stairwell by the counseling wing um, to enter school. And we are, are likely to do something very similar for dismissal. Um, we're working out the logistics of dismissal and what that will look like. Um, but we will have, uh, you know, our safety officers, our administrators, our support staff, all working together with our school nurse in the morning to check in students, greet everybody. And um, we are really excited to have everybody back. Thank you. Would anyone else like to share any other words? I, th I think we're good. All right. So again, health and safety, uh, shared books brought home must be quarantined for 70, 72 hours before uh, we turn them over then to the next student, just so parents know that. And paper-based assignments should only be handled by individual student and teacher with teacher washing hands after handling each paper, no mixing of papers. If materials are shared, they must be wiped down between use. Desks will be disinfected and sanitized after students leave each day by our cleaning staff. And between classes, our, our staff will, uh, it will, with help from students, uh, will be wiping down uh, the student areas at the secondary level. Um, Ms. O'Shea, would you like to add anything there? Um, no, uh, principals and teachers will be working on these procedures with the sharing of materials and we'll be making sure that um, not continued notifications are being sent home. Thank you. So cleaning and disinfecting protocols, commonly touched areas, uh, door handles, desks, tables will all be cleaned and sanitized daily. We have fully implemented the CDC enhanced cleaning and disinfecting protocols and ventilation. Our building automation systems will be utilized to increase the flow of outdoor air to the maximum that temperatures will allow. The filters have been changed, coils have been cleaned and commissioning of the system is underway and we've repaired window screens. So Jim, can you talk a little bit about our cleaning protocols and ventilation, please? Well, we're going to meet with all the principals and compile our checklists of what was going to happen until I kind of get a better handle on the school schedule. Can't really say how it's going to go through the day. Basically, at night, cleaners will be disinfecting and uh, all the tables, desks, chairs, and everything that's commonly touched. And some of that will happen throughout the day from the day custodians as well. The ventilation system, uh, we're going through making sure every piece of equipment is operational. So I would try to re remind people that all of this equipment was engineered to be in your school. So if, at the time it was installed, it was what was recommended. So obviously some of that's changed now with COVID. 
but um, you will have systems that are fully operational. I can guarantee that. Thank you. Um, when it gets colder out, should kids, you know, dress a little bit warmer this year if we have windows open or what are your thoughts about windows? I think you little common sense goes a long way with windows. Um, just to, when it's freezing out, you may have to close them down a little bit. Uh, same thing when it's 100 degrees. You're not really going to cool down a room if you're bringing in all 100 degree heat air. So. Uh, use a little common sense there and let the systems do their thing. We can bring in enough outdoor air through the use of the HVA system where I personally feel you don't need to open the windows, but if somebody is more comfortable opening a window and having fresh air blowing, by all means, I'm not going to stop them from doing that. Thank you. So hand and respiratory hygiene, we have signage all over our, our building serving as reminders and, and procedures. Hand sanitizers will be available in every classroom at building entrances and in common areas. And I did talk about contact tracing already. Um, because of contact tracing, very important that we keep accurate attendance and up-to-date student schedules. Visitor logs um, are at the entrances of our buildings um, for uh, school um, business related uh, visitors. So I just mentioned visitors. So visitors to our buildings will be restricted to those required for essential school business only. Parent meetings will be held virtually. Um, so uh, uh, I think it's going, going to be fine if there is a health and safety issue with it, with any of your children. Obviously, we will let you come in, so don't worry about that. Use of bathrooms, we will have uh, hopefully a teacher aide. That, that's our goal, um, stationed at each bathroom on the outside just to ensure that usage is limited at any one time. Outside learning, our teachers are really excited to have um, bring their students outside and, and conduct classes outside. So. So you can expect uh, to hear that from your kids. And we do have health safety rooms that have been set up. They're in a separate location in each one of our buildings at Harmony uh, Middle School and High School. They will be located in a separate area inside the nurse's office at um, Van Skyke and Abram Lansing in the main office conference room. So, so that is if a student is exhibiting symptoms um, and the student's feeling sick. Now, the nurse's office will be used for students who are getting meds or students who maybe fell on the playground, um, who need student who needs a band aid. So, so that will be for the traditional uses of um, for our nurses offices. We will continue to have emergency drills, so we'll have our lockdown drills, we'll still have our fire drills, our evacuation drills, and we will do it in a way that maintains social distancing at our exits and gathering points. Um, but please understand we still need to prepare our students in how to respond to the emergencies. Um, so we are looking into increased safety measures. This is something that our teachers asked, since we will be going outside more, um, it is something that we're looking into, and we've provided additional workspaces um, for our teachers. And they can, um, we can also accommodate our teachers for social distancing. So now to instruction. So as you know, we have two models. We have our on-site model, and we have our fully virtual model. So on-site, so as I think everybody knows, K-5 is on-site daily. We have added additional sections um, at Van Skyke, at Harmony Hill, and Abram Lansing, again, to accommodate lower class sizes so that we can make sure that everybody is uh, six feet apart um, in the classrooms. So we have everybody in pods, as we've mentioned before, Special area teachers will travel to the classrooms to provide instruction. AIS teachers will push into the classrooms and special education teachers, as well as related service providers will also push in as much as possible. Uh, Ms. O'Shea, did you want to say a few words? 
Um, so just so everyone knows, uh, Aaron Hill, the Director of Special Programs, Karen Renessi, Assistant Director, and I um, will be talking, going through each of the children's services uh, later later this week. And as Dr. Spring said, um, pushing in as much as possible, um, you know, pulling pull out in small groups will be okay outside. And also um, we're exploring large areas to, to do that, not individual uh, classroom areas. So we do have Karen Renessi with us this evening. Um, would you like to add anything? Um, no, I mean, I know our different students have different needs and I know uh, I've heard a lot of parents are concerned about services being pushed into the classroom, but we need to remember that a lot of these classes are gonna be much smaller than usual. So that's going to enable us to have some extra room to do that without a lot of distraction. And like Ms. O'Shea said, if that can't be done, we are looking into, um, you know, some different options for students who really need to have services outside the room. Thank you. Thank you. So students will eat breakfast and lunch in their classrooms. Breakfast will be distributed as a grab and go offering at the different entrances. Lunches will be delivered to the classrooms daily, and we will have peanut free rooms. So if there are known allergies in a room, we definitely will have designation. So I don't want parents to worry about that. And we will have aides covering the classrooms during lunch. So at the secondary level, we do have an every other day model. We are bringing in half the students on one day and the other half of the students on the next day. And we are dividing them into the blue team and the gold team. We also have um, the one day on site and the next day is an at home learning day. Lessons will be self guided assignments posted through Schoology or handed out during in person lessons, videos, posted lecture notes, reading and writing activities and exchanges through discussion boards. So that's what you can expect on the at home learning day numerical grades will be given and principals are still working um, with staff on how exactly we are going to track attendance for the at home learning day, but we are required to do so. So we will provide more information on that. Um, and apparently they're called peanut free rooms and we have peanut aware room. So that's from Mr. Bird. So thank you, Mr. Bird for the clarification. So the fully virtual model. So here hot off the press. So the polls close this evening, so to speak. So we have uh, 437 students. So it's roughly about 23, 24% of our student population who is selecting to participate in the fully virtual model this year. So uh, what that means is we still have roughly 76, 77% of our students who are choosing to be in person. We wanted to make sure that we offered the fully virtual model. We do know that that is um, a better option for many of our families and, and we're happy that we've been able to work closely with our counselors, our principals um, to be able to get that uh, going and up and running in our plan um, in place. So at the elementary level, students will be expected to connect online with their class according to the following schedule. Their day really will be from 9 a.m. to 2.45. They'll have two hours of ELA, an hour of math, and an hour and 45 minutes um, divided between um, maybe every other day Science, social studies uh, will definitely include social emotional learning and anything else that the teacher feels is really important. Um, lunch will be from 1130 to 1230. Uh, I do want our families to know that even though you'll be in the fully virtual model, you are still entitled for uh, breakfast and lunch from the school district. So that is something that we will be letting you know. Uh, it will be available in your school building and we are looking into the possibility of distribution sites and drop drop off sites in the city, but we will let you know about that once we have a better idea of, of who's um, interested in uh, picking up and or 
if that's that might be a hardship during lunch or to, to walk that far, I'm not sure. So specials, art, music, phys ed will be self-directed, project-based. Participation in these areas can occur during lunch, break, or after school. So students will be grouped by grade level with students joined from the district's three elementary schools. So that means you could be in a class with students from Van Skyke in second grade, Harmony Hill, Abram Lansing. Um, so we're joining everyone together um, and uh, so that we can have full classes. So Zoom and Google Meets will be the meeting platform. Google Classroom will continue to be utilized for students to access materials and assignments. We will also provide textbooks and workbooks and special ed students and our English as a new language students will receive direct and indirect supports and attendance will be taken. So at the secondary level, we will have uh, again, blue and gold teams. We are going to have an every other day model in the sense that one day will be live synchronous instruction uh, with their teacher. And then the next day will be self-directed with lessons that are recorded or posted online. So during the live instruction, students will be expected to be online according to their period by period schedule. Um, and students will get a period by period schedule that is different from uh, the model that we used in the, uh, the spring. So virtual sections of classes are being created now. So we're we're still working on this. As you can imagine, it was a total undertaking um, and revamping of our schedules at both the middle school and the high school. Um, we are not mixing virtual and in-person classes. So uh, a student who's in the virtual section, there will only be virtual students um, in that section. Uh, would any principals like to add anything um, about the, the virtual model? Um, either at the elementary level or the secondary level. Okay, I'll continue. So you should get your children's schedules by September 1st. That's our, our uh, we're hoping before then, but definitely no later than September 1st. And just please bear with us this year as we did have to uh, do a lot of uh, change uh, changes to the schedule so that we could accommodate both models. So the emphasis at the secondary level will be on four core courses, our world language courses, as well as regions courses. And we are making every effort to offer virtual opportunities and advanced courses and electives. Uh, but due to staffing and enrollment considerations, uh, we won't be offering all courses. So, so that's why uh, counselors will be in touch with students who have selected this model to discuss some of those um, considerations um, and maybe uh, choices that students may have to make. At the middle school, art, music, and uh, PE classes will be more project-based and more self-directed. Period by period attendance will be taken. And um, I know that at the high school physical education, I think uh, is going to be asynchronous, yes. So Chromebooks, so we did order an additional 550 Chromebooks this year. There are some issues with the supply chain um, and it's not just our school district, but this is being felt everywhere. We're, we're having a hard time getting the delivery of our Chromebooks. Uh, we were lucky that the other week we received 58 out of the 60 ordered for the middle school. So that's great for the middle school. Uh, we do have a survey that is live right now and we're hoping if you haven't completed that survey yet that you still will. And we are asking about your access to devices at home and what is your home internet service like? Is it reliable? Do you have it? Um, again, we're looking to see how, how we can help facilitate that for families. We are also working to get device donations from area businesses, and we would facilitate that and give right to our families. Um, we've ordered some MiFi's hotspots for our homeless students, 
And we also have some hot spots in each one of our parking lots in each one of our school parking lots, just so uh, so you know that that is there in case of an emergency. And BOCES is trying to work on a partnership with Spectrum to be able to offer home internet to our families. Once I have more information on that, I will provide that to, to you. So, could, just, this, oops, yes. could I just mention something about yes. Chromebooks? Because some parents have asked, can their child bring their Chromebook to school? And that answer is yes, if you have, a, if your child has a Chromebook and if you wish to purchase a Chromebook for your child, you can touch base with the principals and they can give you some information. So I do have a question here. Will masks be required on the playground? And the answer is no. So we will not require masks on the playground. So that is one of our mask breaks. So please send in your questions or your comments to feedback at cohos.org. I would also like to ask our principals or uh, um, I see we've got Jeff Huno on our um, athletic director. Uh, Jeff, would you like to give um, any kind of updates to our families about athletics? Okay, he, he was on. Well, at this point, we're still waiting to hear from um, uh, the, um, about athletics and, and they have been postponed until September 21st. So we are waiting to hear if that um, will happen. At this point, we believe that will happen. That means that we will have an abbreviated schedule, but, but I think um, we um, will wait for further information on that. Okay, here's another question. Virtual class sizes seem rather large for some grades. Is there a cap on the number of students in the virtual program? And will there be an issue transferring back to in-person at the end of the 10 weeks? Um, so, so basically, yes, our, we will not have any class sizes more than 30, no. Um, that is our, our contractual limit is 30. So that is the number that we um, will not, that is our cap, 30 is our cap. So we are looking for families to commit for 10 weeks. And if families are interested in coming back to the in-person model, then um, we, you know, our goal is to be able to accommodate requests at that time. Um, again, it, we're not sure how involved that may be at the time and how much shifting there may be of staff, we're, we're not sure. Uh, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens at that time. But again, our goal is to be able to accommodate parents' requests um, for each 10-week period. All right, and then the same thing about masks and outdoors. So we are not requiring masks outdoors. And a question about recess. Yes, we will still have recess during lunch. Kids will go outside. Wait, do I think an elementary principal, can you help me with that one? Mr. Bird, you want to help me with the recess and lunch? I believe we're still having recess, right? Aren't kids going outside? To have recess. Uh, sorry, we're going to attempt to have recess. Okay. <clears throat> we have, because the teachers have duty-free lunch, it will be in an aid in each of the classrooms. So we're hoping that the kids, when they're finished with their lunch, the aid can take them outside. Very nice. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. So how does it work with siblings going to the same school in different grades and dropping off at two different doors and two different ends of the school? So this is a Harmony Hill parent can I have um, uh, our principal, Mr. Perry, answer now? We will have um, two different drive ups. We'll have a drive up on, on either side of the building. So they have their choice. They could drive up on one, drop one student off, drive up on another, drop the other student off. We also have aides that, we'll, that we're planning to have out front to help walk students 
carefully and safely to the other door. So, um, and I will most likely be out there 99% of the days. So, uh, uh, they will be fine. They will be fine. The doors that we're talking about are the doors outside of the fifth grade, fifth grade um, wing and the art room, the main entrance door, and then the doors that they use uh, uh, down by the music room. So they're relatively close. Uh, and again, we, we plan to have plenty of support and, and security out helping out. Thank you, Mr. Perry. So here's a, a question about clarification of book bags. So what is the reasoning behind the kids not being able to use their own book bags? So uh, in the presentation, we did talk about cubbies and that in the elementary level, um, we've had to take out some of the classroom cubbies. So uh, if it's a space issue and we needed to get the desks six feet apart, we did take out some of those cubbies. So we are still um, looking to see exactly how we're going to, uh, where we're going to put coats and student book bags. Um, I'm not sure if I answered the question, if any elementary principals want to chime in, um, because students can bring their book bags in. Okay. I have a suggestion that maybe the teacher should move from class to class instead of the students to make it easier to clean after each session um, than the kids cleaning their uh, desks. So in the elementary level, the, the teachers are the ones that are moving and the students are not. So that's why uh, this, the students definitely, we don't have to worry about those desks during the, the school day unless there's a mess from lunch. Um, it's at the secondary level where we, we will have different students um, at different times in the day in, um, in classrooms. So that's why we do have to have a procedure in place um, that will be orchestrated by teachers um, cleaning the desks in each classroom. So what if a student is sick and not well enough to attend virtually? Um, some symptoms that, you know, maybe it's not a COVID symptom. How does a parent call them in sick? Um, what would that also require some special attention to COVID policies and prevent them from appearing for in person instruction? So our sick, uh, our reasons for sick being sick and out of school that has not changed. Um, and some students will still be too sick to be able to uh, really, you know, engage in school work virtually. So then you would just contact your your principal, the usual procedure if your child is sick. Um, so so let's ask Dr. DeTerzi that question. So if it's not a COVID related symptom, um, what should this parent do? So if it's not a COVID related symptom, first of all, there's a lot of COVID related symptoms. So um, <laughs> The, uh, even so there's a difference between it's not a COVID related symptom and it's not COVID. Uh, but if for some reason your child has something that doesn't meet any of the criteria for needing to be evaluated, I don't know if one of you could put that slide up again, but it's uh, fever, um, cough, loss of taste or smell, sore throat, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, runny nose, um, I may be leaving one out off the top of my head. That, that's quite a lot of symptoms. Um, so you're probably going to need to contact your doctor in those cases. Oh, muscle pain, thank you. Um, but uh, if for some reason your child is out with something that isn't one of those things, then you only need your doctor if you need your doctor. So if it's something that you can manage at home or it's something you're used to managing at home then just manage it at home keep them out and send them back when they can go back but um it's interesting you brought up the slide with the um attestation uh and the attestation does not ask about vomiting or diarrhea but vomiting or diarrhea is on the list of covid symptoms that will get them sent home from school so that is something that we need evaluation yeah we'll have that Unfortunately, COVID can also be a stomach bug. 
All right, thank you. Will photos of the classrooms for elementary schools be shown at any of these meetings? So I, I guess it's a question on maybe communications and how we're going to really uh, promote all the good things happening inside our classrooms for parents. Um, Aaron, are, are you still with us? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, definitely when we've had a chance to get into the buildings, get all our classrooms set, um, I'm definitely intending to get into some of those classrooms and maybe do a tour with some of the principals just to give people a look ahead of time at what everything looks like and maybe detail some of those changes for our families. Thank you. Um, but, spring, we, yes, uh, go ahead. we kept our open house on the calendar. Um, the staff has been talking about maybe not all at the same night, but um, classroom teachers can give um, a, a short view of what their classroom looks like um, through Google Meet or whatever we're using for um, uh, virtual classrooms as well. And then the one of the exciting things about Parent Square is uh, teachers can post photos right on Parent Square. So we've been encouraging uh, our staff to start thinking about taking photos of their classroom and putting on a Parent Square. Once once we get um, the classroom uh, classes situated by teacher. So once we have teacher class lists, then we can start posting what their classrooms look like. Thank you. So here's the next question. When schools were required to submit their plans, when is the governor's office responding to schools and what's the plan for any changes based on the recommendations that office might be providing? So we did submit our plan and uh, we have not been notified by the Department of Health or the governor's office. So. Uh, at this point, no news is good news. If you do view our website, you will see clearly that the governor wanted to make sure that um, the reopening plan is clearly identified. COVID testing is clearly identified. Contact tracing um, and also our fully virtual model. So those are things that we've done as well as tonight. Here we are having three meetings with parents this week. We had our staff meeting yesterday, so those are requirements that the governor is asking for us to include. Now, if there are any changes in our plan moving forward, we will update our reopening plan on our website. But at this point, everything that was required of us to address from the Department of Health and the New York State Department of Education, we have included it in our plan. We are continuing to refine our plan with more details about the logistics of carrying out um, many of these uh, components, such as the health screening. So, so we we are um, we will continue to do that. And if the governor comes out with anything new that is going to be a new requirement, then obviously we will do that as well. We've been updating our families by pushing out messages on Parent Square. We will continue to do that and we will continue to update our website. Okay, so here, what is the reasoning be behind kids not being able to use their own book bags? This is a sixth grader. Mr. Martinelli, does that ring a bell? So on our supply list, Dr. Spring, I, I always, every year, um, recommend to families that kids use a little string backpack because, um, you know, in days when there's 27, 28 kids in a class, uh, it's, it, um, it, it creates a bit of a hardship. And so most kids, because we don't send home textbooks, we, we haven't done that for years, kids uh, really just need the few materials that they need for each class. In addition um, to that, you know, the teachers keep them very efficient with their notebooks. And so really they just need a couple of notebooks, uh, pens, pencils, and they might have to carry their lunch, uh, things like that. So here's another question, the drawstring bag versus the regular book bag. Um, and that's because uh, it just gets clunky. It gets in the way be on, in the, 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 the walkways between the desks. I mean, 
Yeah, and, and really, that, I mean, that's a recommendation. I mean, there, there are some um, kids that have, you know, to bring some medical supplies or if kids bring a Chromebook, you might want to keep it a little more secure, but most kids do really well with the little string backpack. It, it actually serves them quite well. But if a family um, chooses the regular book bag, is that still okay? I, I think it's okay, but if, if there came a point where too many kids had them and, and it was a, a tripping hazard in the classrooms, then, then we might have to make a different choice. But I, I think we could start out uh, with probably most kids will bring a string backpack and if that's the backpack they have and that they enjoy, then we can try it out. All right, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. So at this time, I, I don't have any, I don't have any other questions here. So um, going once, going twice, going three times. Um, are there any closing statements from any of our panelists? All right, so I'd like to thank all of our panelists and I would especially like to thank Dr. DeTerzi of Harmony Mills Pediatrics here in Cohoes, who is also our district's medical director um, who has provided significant guidance for, for us and uh, we're, we're very grateful, very, very grateful. Oh, here's one last question. All right, hold on. Okay, this is an easy one. Where can we find supply lists? And I know principals have been sending this out. Um, I'm going to have one of the principals uh, answer this question. We, I know the elementary principals put them on uh, Parent Square. Um, they're also on. Uh, if you haven't, if you haven't joined or haven't um, done anything with Parent Square, I really suggest you do Parent Square because they're all on there. Thank you. So, um, Ms. O'Shea, I think you got some emails that I didn't. Could you please address those questions? Um, a, a parent asked, what if my child, does my child have to have multiple symptoms to be excluded? Uh, Dr. DeTerzi? No, your child will be excluded with even one symptom. However, if, and the first time that this happens, your child is just excluded. But if this becomes a recurrent thing, such as a child who often has a dry cough due to their asthma or something like this, then an individualized health plan will be worked up between your child's doctor and the school. Um, and I expect where all the local pediatricians are gonna be seeing a lot of these, basically saying, this is a symptom, this is not COVID, as long as this symptom is at the child's baseline, meaning it always looks like it looks for this kid, you don't have to keep sending them home. But if you don't have one of those things in place already, or if something new comes up, then just a runny nose is going to get your child sent home and is going to get your child excluded until they've been 10 days since the first symptom or 72 hours uh, symptom free with a negative COVID test. So just so everyone knows, Dr. DeTerzi works very closely with our school nurses. In fact, uh, we're all meeting tomorrow, so um, she provides a lot of guidance. So, so again, we're very grateful. Um, uh, and here, I, I, this is just a very nice comment from, from a, a mom. You all did a fantastic job this evening. Thank you. So, and we thank you. So, so we love thanking each other, um, you know, having gratitude and, and we're grateful for all of our parents. And we thank you for joining us this evening. Um, again, a huge thank you to our panelists for being here as well. So at this time, if you still have questions after this um, is over, please continue to use feedback at cohos.org. Um, please send us your questions and we will also record this and put it on our website if you'd like to look back on it or refer anyone else to look at it. So thank you very much for joining us. And at this time, I, I wish everyone uh, a very, very nice evening um, and be well.